afternoon from base to race, live from Canada after completing the Yukon Arctic 300 mile foot race. Not only did he go out there and complete it, he came second and it was indeed the third fastest time in course history. Gavin Hennigan, congratulations and welcome to our very first Periscope uh, live feed. Hi Joanne, thanks very much, uh, pleasure to be here. You look very relaxed there Gavin. Yeah, I'm uh, sort of just coming up on three days since the, since the finish of the race, so uh, I've just been uh, eating and sleeping all around me here at the hotel. So tell us a little bit Gavin about uh, the last time we spoke was at the event in Galway, you were heading off to Canada the next day. Uh, what happened between that time you left us in the Salt Hill Hotel and the time you started the event? Tell us a little bit about what the few days were like. Uh, well, I was just kind of winding down from all the training that week and then uh, flew over uh, a week before the race start. Uh, got to Vancouver, spent a couple of days there with friends and then came up to Whitehorse um, and sort of got acclimatised to the temperatures and uh, got all my race kit ready and just did the last few bits of preparation before I um, hit the start line. Uh, would have been last Thursday, you know? So the sled you were carrying, what weight was that? Um, I think it was close to 25 kilos in the end, you know, with uh, with all the uh, food and fuel and uh, safety equipment and stuff like that, you know, so yeah, it was a uh, fair weight, you know. So talk us through, um, you know, what the route was like. So you were following the Yukon River, 300 miles on a foot race. Um, talk us through what it was actually like standing on the start line. Well, yeah, it was pretty amazing. It's, it starts uh, in Whitehorse and it actually is on the Yukon Quest Trail. And Yukon Quest Trail is a, is a, is a dog sled uh, race trail that's uh, it's a very famous dog sled race held every year. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a, a trail that's you know, maintained by rangers um, and it goes onto the, onto the Yukon River and then um, goes up through the mountains and onto lakes and just through the wilderness and intersects a few towns along the way, you know. So yeah, it was pretty, <clears throat> pretty special feeling standing uh, on the start line, about to head off for you know up to a week uh, into the wilderness. Uh, it's a pretty daunting and exciting feeling, you know. And I know we had spoken earlier about your aspirations in terms of a finishing time. I'm sure you you never really thought you would do it in five five days, three hours, and seven minutes. You know, all aspirations aside, I might just ask you to move your camera slightly so we can see your see your face more. That's a bit better. Yeah, I mean it was a yeah. phenomenal time, Gavin. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, you know, I, I pushed pretty hard from the start um, and sort of just, I had a plan not to sleep for um, the first sort of, you know, at least the first day, you know, and that kind of worked out pretty well. I actually finished, um, would have been third place in the 100 mile race because it was actually 25 people racing in the 100 mile race. So the guy who, the, the other guy who won the 300 was ahead of me and there was only one other guy. So the two of us beat uh, everyone by one other 100 mile racer. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. But yeah, as I said, that was my plan to um, just keep moving for the first sort of 30 hours without sleeping. Um, and then, you know, just things kind of went went, went into place after that, you know. So talk, talk us through, like, the, the, you started on the start line. You know, when did you actually f feed yourself or drink or what were you eating and drinking as you went along? And how had you planned how you were going to keep yourself nourished and not get frostbite along the way? Yeah, so obviously that, that comes down to a lot of man management of, of, of yourself, you know, so um, I had like a bum bag with, you know, food and drink in it, so I just keep keep snacking away on uh, on uh, flatjack bars and um, jellies and stuff like that, you know, and then, um, uh, you know, just looking after the body then, like changing layers and stuff, and then you said, like, especially socks, they got damp, um, things like that, you know, so just, as I said, just managing, managing everything as I, as I went along, you know. And did you talk to anybody along the way? I know you did very well in terms of at one point you were actually leading the race. You were telling us a very funny story about Jan, how you had arranged at one checkpoint <laughs> yeah. uh, to take a little yeah. bit of a break and go together. So yeah. what happened there with Jan, who was the eventual winner? And indeed, we give him his due in that he broke the course record by a, quite a number of hours. Um, yeah. Tell us a little yes. bit about that. So we, we uh, I, didn't, I didn't actually know what position I was in to begin with because there was a lot of people who took off off the start line pretty fast, you know. So um, as, as the first night came by, I started to pass a lot of people because it got into the hills, you know, and my advantage would have been, would have been climbing, um, you know, to the hill running and stuff like that. So I started to pass a lot of people. So by the time I got to the 100 mile checkpoint, uh, Jan was there and I just realized he was the only guy ahead of me. So we had a chat and he'd, he'd just had a sleep and he said, do you want to leave together? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll meet you back here in 10 minutes. Um, and then I came back in 10 minutes and his stuff wasn't there, so I kind of just assumed that he'd ditched me and left, so I said, right, I'm going to chase him down. So I took off up the trail, and then about uh, 7 or 8k in, I met one of the snowmobile drivers, and I said, I said to him, 
you know, how far is, is Jan ahead of me? And they were like, what do you mean? You're the only guy out here. You're, you're, you're leading the race. And I was like, oh my God, he thinks, you know, I thought he I ditched, ditched me. <laughs> but you know, he must have thought I ditched him. So I just kept going anyway, because I said, well, should, I might as well just keep moving here and feel pretty good, you know? And then we got down onto these lakes that were quite quite long and big. And, then, and I knew he'd be coming up behind me pretty fast. So I actually turned off my headlights and I could see him back about 5K and I just kept moving. I said, right, I'm going to try and, uh, try and um, stay ahead here, you know? Um, but uh, I, I, I hadn't slept and he did, you know, he had a, he had a, a bit of sleep in the bank. So eventually I had to, I had to move me down. Um, and at that point he did catch me and pass me, you know. So um, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was funny, funny part of the race really, you know. So how but do you, after that, yeah, how do you keep going? Like you've mentioned that you didn't sleep yet. You still had the competitive streak. 34 hours into the race, you were still thinking, I got to stay ahead of this guy. I'm going to turn off my headlight. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I suppose I, yeah, I, I, I suppose I used that competitiveness to try and uh, drive me forward. You know, like I, I, I didn't want it to take me out of the race at the same time, but I wanted it to, you know, keep me on my toes. And I suppose that worked as well. You know, um, but it, you know, you have to sleep eventually. You can't get away with it for that long. You know. We actually have had a question in on and Periscope. Um, they've asked, you know, how did your pacing strategy uh, change this year versus last year's longer ultra distance event? Yeah, so this year I had a I had a Garmin Fenix uh, watch with me, and uh, so I was accountable to my pace, you know. So I, I had I had I had markers down for the whole race on, on what I wanted to do for each stage. So you know, it's very easy to sort of your, your pace to slip back, and uh, especially when you get tired and not to be aware of it, you know. So it was important for me to uh, t to sleep when I was really slowing down, and then you know to pick up the pace again and try and keep keep to those markers, you know. And in the checkpoints, I know uh, following the news on the tracker, um, they were talking about how there were certain checkpoints and they had food provided for you and there was different houses were busy. Talk us through what they, what they were like, because it's very hard for us to understand what, what they were like as checkpoint areas. Yeah, some of them were just uh, walled tents in the middle of nowhere, because like, a lot of these stages they just go completely out into the wilderness. Um, so we, we, they'd have a, a tent set up with a fire and stuff, you know. Um, they provide like soup and a, a meal for us there, you know, and, and but not, you know, you still have to sleep outside. Um, so, you know, they were they were really cool because they were just like in the middle of nowhere, and it was kind of like a, a really good atmosphere there. There was like the volunteers, a lot of people come from all over the world to volunteer, people who, who are interested in maybe racing in the future. So it was a, it was a great atmosphere, you know. And how did you feel uh, knowing that you were doing so well? I mean, you you must never have expected. To have done so well going out there. I mean, I know you had done a huge amount of training and work, and your mindset certainly wasn't the right place. And we spoke uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but how did you, you know, how did you feel throughout it all? Um, yeah, the fact that I was, you know, up, up the field in the position I was in, like sort of halfway through, was was really energising for me. I, I, you know, I felt I felt really good about that, and I kind of, I, I couldn't believe it at one stage, you know. But um, I just said, look, you know, this is kind of what I trained for, and, and I. You know, I didn't, I didn't, didn't sleep very long. The longest I slept was two hours. You know, so I was constantly um, just trying to stay relentless. You know, like and and I just wanted to keep moving. You know, and I, I suppose I had a lot more belief this year just to to do that. You know. So there's a couple of questions coming in on Periscope. Kevin is is writing them down here for me. Uh, one of them is, uh, how does the training versus racing experience differ? Uh, well, to be quite honest, there's nothing can prepare you for being out there. That's that's the reality of it. Um, and I suppose knowing that, knowing that in advance is 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 important, you know. And then that's part of the allure for me. Like you know, like I can't. There's no way I can replicate uh, the Yukon minus thirty. Uh, you know, three days without you know a lot of sleep. I can't replicate that in Ireland in any way. You know, so that's part of the excitement for me that I'm going into the complete unknown. You know, um, and it's almost like being transported to another dimension. You know, so um, I suppose like I suppose. I, I did quite well in that regard, you know, but um, yeah, I, I, I did enjoy that aspect of it as well, you know. And bring it back to uh, Annapurna uh, before Christmas, you, you, you attempted to yeah. climb the 10th most difficult mountain in the world. How does that compare to this or does it at all? Um, they're very different in, in a lot of ways, you know, but I suppose it's just being in that environment where, you know, you've got to be super aware of yourself um, and, and the conditions, you know. And again, you know, they are completely different, but there's a lot of similarities, you know, you know, that you have to look after yourself and you be aware of, of, of everything, you know, like your, um, you know, the sort of dangers around you, you know. So there's, there are similarities, like I suppose for me, Annapurna and climbing Abu Dhabi in Nepal in November were excellent preparation in uh, for the Yukon Archiculture. They're completely obscure things to do, but, you know, the fact that I was in like minus 20 cold, um, you know, sleeping outdoors in the tent, 
um, you know, you know, facing sort of tiredness in the same sort of ways, you know, is 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 perfect um, preparation for that sort of event. Were you ever frightened, um, Gavin, out on the course? Were you ever scared, or you know, how did you deal with the back chatter that was telling you you um, weren't going to be able to do it, or did you have any of the back chatter? Yeah, I didn't really have too much. Now, the, my biggest fears um, where I got scared was when I was very, very sleep deprived when I started hallucinating. Um, I think there was one period where I was kind of stumbling along and I, I literally blacked out for about 20 minutes. I was half asleep and I was um, I was hallucinating pretty badly. Um, so that was kind of scary, you know, but at those points you need to just sort of get into the bivy and sleep for an hour and then kind of get moving after that, you know. And how many layers of clothes had, were you wearing? You know, were you covered in thermals? Had you three or four layers of gloves? Or how did you stay warm? And were you sweating? So, yeah, I, I assume to, you were. Were you sweating? Uh, no, you had to manage your sweat now. That's one of the most important things not to sweat uh, because you'll get, if you sweat, you, your, your uh, liners will get wet and then you'll, um, that'll freeze later on. So um, I, had, uh, I had three sets of gloves on, so I had a liner, a mid pair, and then a big pair of mitts. Um, and then I had maybe three layers on my top and two on the bottom. So yeah, I was pretty wrapped up most of the time. And then I had, whenever I stopped, then I'd put on my big down coat, uh, my down pants, you know. So I'd, I'd stay warm if I was stopping for any period of time, you know. So you got to stay, uh, it's really important to uh, stay warm and stay hydrated so that, you you know, you don't, uh, as soon as you start getting cold, like it really changes everything, you know. And in terms of staying hydrated, how did you keep your liquids as liquid? Yeah, I had a bit of a problem to begin with. I had a, I actually had a camelback that I was going to wear inside my uh, my mid layer, um, but the thing broke just before the uh, as I was filling it in the morning, so I had to ditch that. And then all I had was like a, a juice bottle that I uh, that I had from the store, and I had to keep that inside my jacket all the time, you know. So then I had uh, I had two flasks inside my sled, so they'd be um, they they'd be full of hot water, so I'd be able to transfer the hot water into the. Uh, into the bottle and keep the bottle on my body the whole time so that it wouldn't freeze otherwise yeah if I'd left it in the sled it would froze you know and I'm presuming that as the days went on your sled got lighter but you were obviously more tired so did the sled you know so from a physics point of view did the sled feel heavier or lighter <laughs> yeah, at the finish did. of the race so the, the sled uh, you know I had a the sled with a, um, a rope and then there was like a I had a, a bungee cord shock absorber but uh, you can imagine as that goes over all the bumps and stuff, it would get uh, get kind of yanked along. So I was kind of tr I was dragging it up little hills, and it would come down, actually come down the hill after me, and sometimes try and take me out, you know. So uh, <laughs> made for some made for some interesting times, you know. And uh, I suppose the other question I want to ask you, Gavin, really is uh, you mentioned there the sleep deprivation piece was probably the hardest time. Um, yeah, yeah. Was there any point where you thought I can't do this? Um. Yeah, there was actually, I, I you know, because I was being competitive, you know, I was trying to, um, you know, trying to catch Jan, um, and I was thinking about my time and, and, and being a, doing a fast time, and uh, there was a lot of stuff like this, um, and then during that sleep deprivation, you know, I, I actually, I, I, I did go to sleep for an hour, um, but I woke up, and I actually didn't know where I was, like, I, it took me about five minutes to figure out that I was in the Yukon, that I was in a race, and I was just, because I was, I'd been super cold, and i you know, I was, as I said, really sleep deprived and stuff. So I had a moment there where I was just like, hang on a minute, like forget about this race, like forget about Jan, forget about the time. Like the most important thing in the world is to get to the finish line, you know. And it, you know, at that moment, it felt touch and go, and it just highlighted to me the importance of this of the medal, which is it's it's a it's a finisher medal. It's not a first place, a second place, or anything like that. You know, you know, so many people have put so much on the line just to finish this race, and you know, so I just at that moment I just dropped any ideas of you know, winning anything and just said, look, I need to finish this. This is the most important thing in the world. And I don't care. If it takes me another four days. I'm going to finish it, you know. So then t talk us through, I suppose, the last hour, maybe the last two or three hours of the race where you obviously knew you were coming second. Um, yeah. You know, were, was there support anywhere along the course at the final checkpoints, you know, encouraging you along, saying you've only got like two miles to go or three miles to go? <laughs> no, or, no, you're completely no. on your own. Um, yeah. out there and, and that, that was just part that's that's what I, I didn't expect anyone to be there you know I knew I had a I had plenty of people following me on the track at home you know so I was kind of drawn on that but there was a point where um because the last stage you go out back on on a, on a road and myself and Jan passed each other you know so we um we had a moment uh where we we hugged each other and uh I told him I'm sorry I'm not going to make this easy on you um you know I'm going to chase you down as hard as I can till the end you know 
um, and you know since then like the two of us have been the best of friends you know so and we're ta- already talking about uh, you know other adventures and other races we can do you know so he's forgiven you for ditching him and uh, running away <laughs> from him for 10 minutes 10 minutes early yeah yeah, yeah he, he says he wouldn't have broken the record without me uh, pushing him like I did, you know. So yeah, yeah it uh, yeah it was it was good, you know. It was like like these sort of events, you know, it's not, you know, you know we're we're kindred spirits. People come out here and do this sort of stuff. So you know, it's all about the friendship and then meet each other and talking about other things to do together. You know. Were you emotional on the finish line, Gavin? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. When I came in and finished, you know, because it was you know I'm dreaming about it for the last year, you know, and. Um, yeah, you know, as, as I said before, you know, I didn't, I got, I did get caught up in the race, you know, but finishing it was the, the ultimate goal. So, you know, that was, uh, you know, when I did finish, it was, uh, it was, I had a quiet moment and it was, it was important for me, you know. If you had to choose any one highlight of the 300 miles, what would you say it was? Um, I'd say probably just, you know, being out there moment after moment in, in the wilderness, you know, coming you know, coming down onto these big lakes and then, you know, just seeing, you know, this amazing sunsets and um, the northern lights and stuff like that. Just, you know, just incredible wilderness, um, just a, a amazing trail, just, just kind of meanders through this, these forests and stuff. It's just uh, absolutely spectacular, you know. We're, we're, getting a, we're getting a question here. Kevin is writing furiously something about a phone call. Uh, how, how are your family now after you've finished it? I'm sure they're probably very relieved that you're back on safe ground and um, you know that you're getting ready to, to relax for a few days in Vancouver and then come home to Galway. Yeah, I am. Uh, I, yeah, like everyone's, uh, was follow, a lot of people follow me. And um, so I think some people weren't getting lost sleep, like my mother probably and some of that, you know, so... Uh, they can all relax now, you know. Um, but I think it was quite funny for a lot of people because it did obviously go on for like five days, and people were getting quite hooked on the tracker, you know, and seeing where, how I was doing, you know. Yeah, addicted on uh, Wednesday night. I was pre- hitting yeah. refresh. I don't know how many times. Somebody has asked, uh, ask him about his phone call to me when to Kevin Thornton actually when he was hallucinating. <laughs> did you ring Kevin yeah, so while you were hallucinating? I was coming into um, coming into Carmax, uh, which is the one of the big checkpoints where. Uh, you, there's a town and you can get a uh, phone signal and stuff like that, you know. So I said, uh, I said I'd give Kev a call because I just needed to kind of almost like uh, get myself out of this sort of headspace, which is just, well, you know, the, the sort of hallucinating and stuff. So yeah, I gave call, Kev a call and just to tell him how epic the uh, the whole thing has been so far. <laughs> and that, uh, Were, you how, how you know? yeah. Were you crying? Were you crying? Were you crying? Were you crying? No, I didn't. I wasn't crying. No. That's not what Kevin said. <laughs> uh, one, another question we have is ask him about his frostbite scare and the background to it. Oh, right, yeah. So on, I think it was the fourth morning. Um, I, uh, it was quite cold. It gets very, very cold um, sort of early in the morning. It seemed to, you know, and when you, you drop, you end up coming uh, into like sort of riverbeds and valleys and the temperature can drop considerably. Um, and I had my gloves off just for a couple of minutes and my fingers, oh, my fingers got numb. So I obviously got my gloves back on and got moving quickly, but <clears throat> my baby finger um, got, the end of my baby finger got super numb. And um, so I realized that like, yeah, this is quite serious. So I, I, I kind of, what ensued was probably 45 minutes of, of manic uh, trying to heat my finger back up again because it was at the point of, oh, I could feel that it was actually freezing, the blood was freezing there, it was completely numb, you know. So, um, yeah, I put on my down coat, put on, like, all my heavy gear, and I started running as fast as I could to get heat up my point, body, yeah. heat up my core and get the blood flowing to the extremities, you know, and then just, like, just smashing my hands together and, like, shaking my fingers and just... You know, just really focusing on trying to get the, the blood flowing into my finger again. You know, and, and you know, I was definitely at the point if if I didn't get that finger, um, you know, warm in, in, in that time, in that time it would have it would have gone to frostbite for sure. You know, that must have been very scary. Yeah, like it was. I was I was angry at myself that I'd you know um, uh, let that happen. You know, because I you know managing myself was one of, one of the most important things. And like there were plenty of people that got pulled out of the race for frostbite, probably five or six already. You know, and that, and that all comes down to people being tired, you know, taking off their gloves, not like not looking after themselves, not being 100% aware of your body and, and the things that are going on with it. You know, so you look at, obviously that was a scare, but I knew what to do, like which is you know obviously get get really frantic and get warm and try and get as I said, get the, the blood um, warm to get the blood flowing to the extremities. You know, uh, would you do it again? I would. Yeah, there's a 430 mile race. That I'd oh like mother! Uh, yeah. So. Oh God, when is that? Uh, they have it every two years, so it might be um, uh, 
Uh, maybe 2019, I'm going to leave it for a while because I've got a few things on the cards, you know. So, those few things on the cards, you're getting ready for the next big adventure. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, at the end of the month, uh, beginning of March, I'm heading to Siberia to um, uh, walk across uh, Lake Baikal, frozen Lake Baikal in Siberia. It's uh, the biggest freshwater lake in the world. It holds 25% of the world's freshwater. And it's also the deepest, it's I think 1,600 metres at its deepest. And in the winter, it completely freezes over. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, walk across the ice. Uh, it's 640 kilometres long. So, um, providing everything um, in this meat wagon is uh, in working order in the next couple of weeks, I'll be uh, heading off over there, you know. You and Jan, best buddies now to go take on Siberia. Will he be tempted to do it? <laughs> he is actually tempted to go, but uh, unfortunately can't make it. Yeah, he's running in the uh, UTMB this year, you know. So, But yeah, we've been talking about coming back. Um, to do the 4.30 mile uh, okay. Yukon Articulture in a few years. I know you mentioned your feet were quite swollen. Can you show us your feet? Or are they really bad? Um, are they they've much actually, better? They've actually, they're all right now, actually. They've, they've calmed right down. Um, I'll try and... Uh, no, I think they're, they're pretty much back to normal. But and, and it is, of course, it's 10 to 10 in the morning in Canada, so we're assuming you're out of your PJs. Yeah, no, I've just had a, a mammoth breakfast and uh, I'll probably go have another one now in a minute. Okay. <laughs> well, listen, Gavin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so this has been an interview with uh, Gavin Hennigan, finished in second place in the Yukon Arctic 300-mile uh, ultra foot race uh, in Canada. Uh, third fastest time, in fact, in the course ever. He finished in five days, three hours and seven minutes. Uh, in second place to Jan Christie, who broke the course record. Delighted to have him on board with us today. That's been our first uh, Periscope uh, broadcast. Thank you to Kevin Thornton for setting it all up and to Base to Race for hosting us this afternoon. Gavin, I wish you a very hearty second breakfast and we'll talk to you next <laughs> week. Enjoy your downtime. Thank you so much and congratulations again from everybody in Galway and in Ireland on your achievement. Thanks very much, Jan. Cheers. Bye.